All right, back to the Monoginians, part two. <clears throat> so uh, as I mentioned in the previous lecture, having fish in high densities really uh, passes parasites between one another, especially if you're working with the gyrodactylus parasites because they reproduce really quickly and their offspring can only get passed from one host to another if they're in very close proximity. Uh, one example of a gyrodactylus parasite that uh, has caused huge economic losses is gyrodactylus salaris, which is also known as the salmon fluke. It infects uh, Atlantic salmon, uh, which, is, which is the fish in the picture, and uh, the, what the parasite looks like is to the right. So Atlantic salmon uh, are found in lots of different areas in Europe, and they tend to have different strains. And what that means is that they're locally adapted to a specific area and to the specific conditions in that area. Which also means that if you have Atlantic salmon in one area and there's not a lot of gene flow between Atlantic salmon in another area, uh, then it not, it's not necessarily the case that all of the different Atlantic salmon will be able to resist the same parasites. So it can be the same species, but if it hasn't seen, uh, in an evolutionary sense, the parasite in a long time, then it might not have any immune defenses to fight it. And what we found is that there's a Baltic strain of Atlantic salmon that have the gyrodactylus salaris parasite, and that parasite doesn't do much uh, in terms of causing negative effects or pathology to the parasite in the Baltic Sea region. But for example, the Atlantic salmon that you find in Norway haven't seen this parasite uh, for a long time, and they essentially don't know how to fight it. So when they get infected, it really knocks these fish out. Uh, so what, what we think ended up happening in this situation was that there were fisheries, uh, and one of the fisheries a a happened to contract Gyrodactylus salaris. And in a lot of instances, uh, fisheries will stock river bodies with parasite, uh, sorry, with fish from their hatchery in an attempt to bolster the natural population. And that can either be because uh, the natural population is endangered, although I don't think that was the case in this situation, or because they want to increase the size of the population for uh, economic reasons like fisheries or uh, to catch the, the fish for food later. So what we think happened was that there was a parasite that was introduced into a natural population, uh, and then we kept moving the parasite around, either by moving around hatchery fish, or because infected fish that were in the wild were moving from place to place and passing the parasite around. So the parasite in this case tends to infect the fins of Atlantic salmon more than it infects uh, the central body of the fish, uh, and these fish, are, and it can infect the fish in freshwater, but when the fish move out to the ocean, uh, which they do after they're born, they spend a little time in freshwater, then they move out to the ocean, and then they come back as adults to spawn into freshwater. So when the adults, or when the individuals move out to the ocean, the parasites die, but whenever they're in freshwater, they're exposed to this parasite, and it can really cause them a lot of harm. So there ended up being huge declines of Atlantic salmon, specifically in Norway, uh, after the introduction of this parasite. And in fact, uh, I read one estimate that 87%, there was a decline of about 87% in the catchable Atlantic salmon in Norway because of this parasite. And they estimated that this could cost as much as uh, 28 million euros, which is, a, which is over 28 and a half million US dollars. And a lot of that money was coming out of fishermen or different uh, fishing industry people. Uh, and so that's a lot of money to be losing. Uh, and so they've started to try to control this the decline of Atlantic salmon by trying to control the parasite, and they're doing this a couple different ways. So first, they're coming up with a bunch of laws, and these laws are prohibiting the movement of hatchery fish from, uh, you know, one hatchery to another, or from hatcheries to natu natural populations, and they're instating a bunch of laws about how hatchery fish need to be tested before they can be moved, uh, so that they can make sure that any fish that do get moved are not infected with the parasite, so the parasite isn't getting moved around also. So one, they're controlling the movement of fish, Two, there's a public uh, education campaign where they're putting out a bunch of flyers to make sure that people aren't inadvertently moving the parasite from one place to another. So, for example, if your canoe was in an infected river and then you put your canoe in an uninfected river later in the day, you could be passing that parasite if the parasite had happened to uh, attach itself to your canoe and then detach. So they're trying to make sure that people are educated about the possibility of moving around this parasite. Uh, in Norway, they're taking some pretty extreme measures to try to control the parasite. Uh, for example, they're putting rotenone into some of their riverways, and rotenone is a chemical that inhibits the electron, tra electron transport chain in mitochondria. And uh, that essentially means that it's stopping the 
the production of ATP, which is used uh, as energy by the host or by all organisms, in fact. Uh, so these, so when a fish comes in contact with rotenone, it can no longer tense its muscles, for example, and so the fish tend to float up to the surface. But the parasites are more susceptible to rotenone than are the fish, and so I believe that low concentrations of rotenone might knock out the parasite before the fish get knocked out. But anyway, they've been treating their waterways with rotenone uh, in an attempt to knock out the parasite and collect infected fish. But that didn't seem to work, and it probably didn't work for a couple of reasons. One, you've got this huge water body. It's probably difficult to figure out exactly how much rotenone you need. And you only need one infected fish or a couple parasites to uh, survive the rotenone treatment to pass it on to the next generation of fish that end up in the waterways. So I believe they're trying new methods of mixing rotenone with aluminum, and aluminum is a lot more toxic to the parasites than it is to hosts. Uh, but these treatments are sort of could be dangerous from an ecological standpoint because they're not specific. So anything that uh, uses an electron transport chain to produce energy, which is pretty much everything that's not a plant, uh, is is probably getting knocked out by this treatment. So uh, anyway, they have so far haven't been successful. So now they're trying some new water treatment methods, and they're also putting up obstructions so that populations where there are infected fish will be blocked off physically from populations where there are uninfected fish. Uh, and in that way, they're hoping to keep infected fish on one side and uninfected fish on the other, so that they can sort of control uh, the parasite that way. It's a it's a tricky situation, and and there's no really good solution, I suppose. So uh, if you happen to have a fish that's infected by some monogenian parasite, the treatment that you should uh, give that fish really depends on how the parasite reproduces. So if you have a dactylogyrus parasite, it's producing eggs. And so if you give the, t the whole tank, for example, a one-day treatment and you kill off all of the adults, and then you remove the treatment from the tank, a couple days later those eggs are going to hatch and you're going to be back in the same situation. So uh, a University of Florida site, I believe, suggested that if you don't know what, what species of parasite you're dealing with or what genus, you should keep try to keep the treatment in the tank for up to 34 weeks so that you can make sure that you cover uh, the egg stage of the parasite and you're knocking that out. But there's some problems with chemical treatments, uh, which is a problem in general with antibiotics uh, and any time you try to treat an organism, which is that there's, some, there's variation in the population for how resistant the, indi the parasite individuals are to a particular chemical. And so if there's an individual in that population that happens to be fairly resistant to whatever chemical it is that you're using, then that individual will be the one that can, goes on to reproduce, and a couple generations later or in the next generation, you're now working with a population of parasites that are better able to resist the treatment that you're trying to give them. And quite often the treatment that you use to kill parasites is also somewhat detrimental to the host. And so you end up with this situation where you need to increase the treatment at higher and higher and higher concentrations. And at some point it becomes detrimental to the host also. And so now you need to find a whole new treatment because you have this resistant, uh, resistant group of parasites. And I think we're coming into this problem with uh, hatcheries and fish farms because they've been overusing different treatments and now they've got these resistant parasites and we need to come up with new methods. Some methods are more complicated than others. For example, in some cases you can kill monogenes with water baths. And essentially what this means is if you have a freshwater fish, you stick it in salt water for five to 10 minutes, for example. Uh, and if you have a saltwater fish, you stick it in fresh water for that same amount of time. And the fish is better able to handle those changes in salinity than the parasites are. So the parasites will die and the fish will recover after you take them out of the water bath and put them back in the right salinity. Uh, this method doesn't work as well when you're working with estuary fish, which are moving between freshwater and saltwater all the time, uh, because they're adapted to those water changes, or changes in salinity, and so are their parasites, because otherwise those parasites couldn't survive on those hosts. So for example, I study fungulus uh, species, which tend to move between water, uh, freshwater and saltwater, and in those cases I might not want to try to use a water bath because I'd be unlikely to succeed. Um, so uh, monogenians have invaded in a number of other different populations. So Gerodactylus salaris isn't the only one that's, caught, that's become an invasive species and is giving us economic and ecological troubles. There have been others. Um, and that's all I have to say about monogenian invaders right now. So real quick, I'm going to show you a video of a monogenian parasite that infected my California killifish, just to sort of give you an idea of how these guys move. Uh, please excuse my awful photography.
So on the right, you can see that it's anchored down onto the surface of the fish. And this one's anchored onto the, uh, the body as opposed to any of the fins. And so it's anchored down on the right, and then on the left, that's its mouth. And the mouth is sort of moving around and feeling around, and maybe it's eating a little bit. Uh, this parasite might be starting to realize that its host is dead, and that it's going to die pretty soon if it doesn't find a new host. So it might not be eating so much as feeling around its environment and hoping to find another fish that it can hook onto. But uh, this is generally how they move. So when they move across a fish, it's sort of leech-like, but in general they clamp down on one end, and then their mouth region sort of moves around and checks out the environment and eats uh, as it's moving around.